I'm going to begin with a just a short story. Um, I was participating in a, a group of scientists who were um, compelled to provide information about how variables should be measured. Um, and this is something about called the Phoenix Initiative, and it was started uh, by folks who are geneticists. Um, and for big GWAS studies, they wanted to create a gigantic database so that anybody who's doing a, this genetic study could look up how to measure with the best state-of-the-art measure of particular health behaviors, personality traits, whatever you can think of about humans um, that a geneticist would need to know about or want to correlate with genetic data. Um, and the... Um, FDA decided that it would be a great idea to extend this model to tobacco control. And so they convened a bunch of us to, into committees. And our committees fit perfectly the have model, as they call it. It used to be A-H-B-E. Um, but it's host, agent, vector, environment, right? So we've been talking a lot about the environment over the past couple of days. And this session is definitely about the vector, right? Um, the, and the vector um, is the industry that helps <laughs> transmit uh, the diseases um, that we're worried about. And you would be amazed at how difficult it was for this group of scientists that I was meeting with to come up with good measures about the influence of the vector. Out of those four letters, host, agent, vector, environment, industry activities are difficult to track, um, attit public attitudes about industry difficult to measure, not the kinds of things that really rise to the level of science with a standard measure that's been psychometrically tested and used in billions and billions of studies and therefore worthy of depositing into a publicly accessible database for all other scientists to use. So with that in mind, um, I just thought that it would be great uh, to talk, we'll talk a little bit about our respective industries and what they share in common and then um, hear from you about dealing with industry or what kinds of measures you need to make your work better, um, that kind of thing. And the theme of this was about <laughs> learning from the tobacco industry playbook. Um, and I just prepared a handful of slides about uh, what big tobacco has in common uh, with uh, big food and big alcohol. Um, and I just talk briefly about a shared corporate history and flavor ingredients, advertising strategies, corporate social responsibility efforts, and attempts to I'll spend a little more time on attempts to influence marketing regulations. Um, this is the only slide I have for this section, but it's worth leaving it on for a while. Um, those of you who are relatively new to public health uh, were not around in the days uh, when our industries were all the same. They were all the same. Tobacco once was food and still is partially alcohol, right? So the three, this is my kudos to a research assistant who helped to put this all together um, for you. The three largest tobacco multinationals are on the board. They are PMI, British American Tobacco, and now Imperial Tobacco. Um, and they have grown <laughs> out of all of these spinoffs, right? Um, Alt Altria was the spinoff from Philip Morris. Altria named for the largest consumer packaged goods company. Um, then Philip Morris took tobacco. They have alcohol. They used to have Kraft Foods. Reynolds American, which is now part of Reynolds, so Philip Morris is Marlboro, right? Reynolds is Camel. Um, they used to have Nabisco. They're all their brands. Cigarette companies now own Smokeless. Um, and more recently, Lorillard acquired Blue, the most popular e-cigarette brand. And now Blue, in the latest acquisition, has been spun off to Imperial. But <laughs> 
One thing as we work towards collective impact is um, for me to persuade you to dislike your industry more. <laughs> Uh, because I find when I work with alcohol and nutrition folks that they're not necessarily as fired up about anti-industry anti attitudes and maybe that's um, just trying to figure out how, what sort of relationship to have with the industry. I still have colleagues in my own department who come rolling into faculty meetings and say things like, I was just at the best comp public health conference in South America. I said, oh, really? Who sponsored it? Oh, PepsiCo. Uh, <laughs> and, and I just wrote, <gasps> don't go. Please don't go. Don't lend your credibility. Um, but you know, that's at some level, that's also a personal decision. But my point here is just merely that the playbook um, that is shared because the, literally the corporate genes are shared, right? And they were, they were all once one and still are very tangled up. Uh, briefly about flavors, because uh, you've heard a lot about it already and I love this image from uh, Tobacco Free Florida. Uh, <laughs> um, I was asked a great question this morning about the importance of uh, perhaps uh, teaching youth about flavored tobacco. Um, and, and while I understand there's a, you know, there are other message f uh, frames than consumer education, um, it is probably worth talking about tobacco industry manipulation. Uh, of course, um, the only flavored cigarettes we have now under federal regulation are menthol. Um, and a quote that didn't get as much air as I thought it would uh, after working on the menthol report for TIPSAC, that was report number one, not report number two, <laughs> um, was a buried in a report from Lorillard Tobacco Company that in explaining its use of menthol said, well, this is analogous, this flavoring is analogous to the sweet, using a few grains of salt in a sweet dish, which of course makes Newport cigarettes and all menthols by comparison, the salted caramels of cigarettes. Um, and that sort of um, insidious notion about flavoring uh, is worth, uh, is a message worth working into our um, public health efforts. Uh, of course, we have an array of flavored non cigarette tobacco products waiting for f uh, federal regulation. And please let me clarify from this morning. There are things we can do about this. Only the feds can actually manipulate what's in the box, what's in the product. But there's lots we can do, state and local level, to ban the sale of these products, right? And I was sorry if I wasn't clear about that. Um, this is the bit of education that I think would be really interesting to teens, and this is from a, a New England Journal of Medicine article recently published, and you probably caught wind of it in the press. But um, imagine coming into a room with a box of products that is so familiar to them, Zots, Lifesavers, uh, Kool-Aid, um, and, and helping them understand that the flavor agents are identical. They are identical. The tobacco ingredients taste the way, they taste and smell the way they do because they literally share the same chemical constituents um, and the colored graphs, which are such a clever part of this um, research article, is you look across uh, these products from food and candy to tobacco like, uh, I'm sorry, my eyes are so bad. Uh, there's a Swisher Sweet up here, Cherry Swisher Sweet, Cherry Cheyenne Cigars, a zigzag wrap, um, that proportion of red that's in each bar is a shared cherry flavoring, the exact same one. And I think that's worth communicating to teens um, in a way that's really vivid to them. So I really appreciate whoever asked that question. Uh, the middle graph is grape. The <laughs> on the bottom is apple flavoring in green. Okay. Um, Steve, where are you? 
<laughs> uh, and a colleague uh, published a wonderful research letter in our journal Tobacco Control about the availability of flavored tobacco products on the internet. Um, with a huge proportion of um, tobacco products sold online. Almost a quarter of them were flavored. More than 40% of little cigars and cigarillos were flavored, um, which gives you some sense of availability. And we talked about availability of tobacco products in stores this morning. Um, his categorization, I thought, of fruit and sweet versus liquor uh, versus anything related to mint was so helpful that we stole it, borrowed it, thank you. <laughs> Um, for the retail assessment for STARS, and we've been using it in California. It's just a great set of buckets uh, for consumers to think about in terms of how to categorize tobacco products and perhaps um, alco pops uh, and other things that you care about uh, for other industries. So uh, thank you for that. Um, let's see. <laughs> uh, if they share something with a brand name that wants to maintain its public health image. Uh, there is a lawsuit going on about this. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, we, we don't want to let uh, e-cigarette companies take the names of products that are that appealing to young people and that threaten the credibility of organizations uh, who are important to youth. Um, <laughs> I'm frustrated about sitting in a room just about this size at, at SRNT in Seattle uh, last February, listening to an executive from Enjoy tell the audience that their company was different because they only had menthol and tobacco flavored products when you know some months later when they extended their brand line that they didn't just invent them in a few months. Um, that's frustrating, and that kind of um, industry manipulation from a company that wants to keep itself as distant from tobacco industry as possible is also worth consumer education, right? So there's a lot of um, anti-industry theming and message framing to do around e-cigarettes and, and their marketing. Uh, <laughs> some of you caught wind of this in the news in a terrific article uh, from, the, uh, from Xu Hongzhu at uh, UCSD. Uh, 446 brands of e-cigarettes, more than 7,000 flavors proliferating at the rate of about 260 flavors a month. I mean, who can keep up with that? Um, and so that's a, another theme worth picking up on, for, especially for uh, tobacco prevention. Um, and I'm going to ask you, please, to join uh, me with the advice that I got from the California Department of Health and their California Tobacco Control Program. I don't use the term e-juice anymore. I don't use the term e-juice anymore because juice is something that can be healthy. And it's a name that appeals to young people. So I only call it e-liquid. I only ever write about e-liquid. Um, and that's again, a frame worth thinking about in your work. Um, that and the fact that if we could ban cartoons uh, <laughs> in advertising for tobacco products, we, also, we ought to be able to extend that regulation to e-cigarette products as well. And for whatever reason, cartoon monkeys and e-liquids are <laughs> very popular on the internet. Um, this slide also gives you information about the importance of flavor appeal to youth and the increase in uh, calls to the Poison Control Center that the CDC has recorded. Um, just other statistics that you probably may already know about the appeal of uh, f flavored tobacco uh, to young people and the use uh, of flavored cigars uh, and cigarettes of, among students who smoke. Uh, the lack of progress in reducing uh, loose use of little cigars among high school students, most of uh, which are probably flavored in what they choose. Uh, past month, e-cigarette use has tripled, according to CDC, over the last two years, up now to just almost 5% among high school students. Um, and a very clever study that uh, asked questions of uh, young adult males about willingness to try an e-cigarette and uh, they compared descriptions of flavored and uh, non-flavored, non and while they didn't find any differences, 
Um, it's a pretty small study, and I, and I wonder whether there's um, a hypothesis there that deserves better, <laughs> better data. Uh, but it's an important question to answer and not something we know the answer to yet. Um, but that's certainly been true for other tobacco products. Um, another thing that the companies share in common are advertising strategies. And here I'm, uh, and these may be image pairs you've seen before, um, and so I'll run through them quickly. Uh, but a, a theme that's come out in the news a bit and is well documented by a group at Stanford um, called Stanford Research into the Impact of Tobacco Advertising. They have an extraordinary library of digital images. Um, this is a project of Dr. Robert Jackler, um, an e uh, ENT doc uh, surgeon who's collected magazine images. To, yes. Oh, Srita, Stanford Research into the Impact of Tobacco Advertising. And they have a website. Um, if you just type in Srita, and a searchable library of images by topic, um, really terrific resource um, for advocacy and, and for research. Um, so <laughs> we were talking about sort of what's old is new again. And so what we're going to run through are themes that tobacco certainly uses uh, that e-cigarettes are now using, um, including the use of cartoon characters. So I think usually I've, uh, I don't know if I've gotten them all in the right order. I meant to put t conventional tobacco on the left and e-cigarettes on the right. So this will be like a test for you to figure out which one. Um, certainly the popular use of celebrity endorsements and um, the appearance of what's her name who also opposes child vaccinations <laughs> uh, uh, has come up quite a bit uh, for, as a spokesperson for Blue. Um, the all-time most famous celebrity endorser ever uh, uh, appear, appears in an e-cigarette bull, uh, billboard. Um, sex appeal and femininity are certainly apparent um, in e-cigarette advertising, and again here, um, uh, Blue is using a bikini ad uh, for a product they claim is meant to obsolete cigarettes. That's their corporate phrase. Um, and that just doesn't scream to me a smoking cessation <laughs> product. Uh, but it does look like something that might have quite a bit of youth appeal. Uh, rebellion um, is another theme in e-cigarette advertising, um, particularly from Blue. Um, and deer, and deer smoking ban is a topic I, I touched on earlier this morning, right? Um, and then there's this notion of freedom and personal choice, which plays nicely into what uh, Lori was talking about um, at, over the lunchtime today. Terrific notion about personal responsibility. Okay, um, something that grown-ups do, right? So that attractive notion of something that adults would do later. Um, and then this issue about being a healthier alternative. Okay, I've gotten the five minute sign. So uh, let me try and wind up on two more topics. Um, another thing that tobacco shares in common with alcohol and food is uh, efforts to create a sense of corporate social, uh, corporate social responsibility um, and concern about their corporate image. Um, <clears throat> this is nicely defined by Patricia McDaniel and Ruth Malone at UCSF as having to do with legitimizing uh, corporation actions consistent with shared norms of appropriate behavior. These are really good guys. Establishing partnerships to enhance credibility um, by joining with other organizations who don't seem to appreciate what sorts of harms come <laughs> to collaborating with the, uh, the industry. Um, and to create the illusion of being a changed company. And this takes place on corporate websites. Uh, Philip Morris talks a lot about its charitable works. Reynolds American talks a lot about green sustainability, a theme that fits very nicely with their uh, natural American spirit brand, right? Um, for a while after the master settlement agreement in the late 1990s, Philip Morris had ran a series of television ads, um, uh, mostly about Oh, feeding refugees in Kosovo and providing uh, food banks with uh, fresh fruit and things for uh, elderly shut-ins. 
um, ads. They spent more on the campaign, the media that campaigned, than on the charities themselves. Um, and this continues, and there's a great link here to a story about uh, Philip Morris coming to the rescue in a, after an <laughs> Indonesian volcano incident. Um, there's a lot of good literature about uh, the futility of youth smoking prevention ads sponsored by tobacco companies. We a long time ago did, in my lab group, did a small experiment with about a little shy of a thousand kids who were randomly assigned to see no ads at all or the truth ads from Legacy Foundation. Um, or smoking prevention ads that were on the air at the time from Philip Morris or a different campaign from Laura Lard Tobacco. And the ads did pretty much what you would expect <laughs> them to do. They uh, slightly increased curiosity about smoking among adolescents, and they greatly increased their sympathy towards the sponsors. So as a measure of what we would now call anti-industry attitudes, um, you know, it, would, it was not good. <laughs> they, are, they work very well to sustain uh, an insidious industry's corporate image. And even better research came after this when we really had good data about um, market share for these ads and uh, actual smoking behavior among youth. And uh, that study from uh, Melanie Wakefield and her colleagues indicated our worst fears, which is that those ads really did boomerang and create more interest in smoking than they pre prevented. Um, this plays out also in industry's attempts to align themselves with youth access efforts. That we card Philip Morris sign is very prevalent in stores. I'm just writing now the opening paragraph uh, of an editorial trying to say that, you know, Com compared to other countries, we have so an few anti-smoking cues at the point of sale, like a point I should have made this morning, um, and I didn't. And often, that's the cue. <laughs> and it's sitting there from Philip Morris, and that's it. Because of course, remember, our warning labels are the smallest and weakest in the world and completely invisible. Um, this plays out in new signage about e-cigarettes, um, particularly in states that have passed uh, legislation about youth access and no e-cigarette e sales to minors. So Reynolds American has gone ahead and put signs in several states, if, uh, have p had a picture of one in Virginia that I couldn't find, that indicates right on their point of sale advertising it is legal to sell these uh, products to minors. And I think that's, it's voluntary and more about creating the image of a good, good company than a genuine effort at reducing youth access. Um, do I have five more minutes? Okay. Uh, my last point, um, I think, is the point that helps us with our work the most, and that is really understanding how these industries respond to what it is we would like to achieve. Um, so, feel like this is a helpful tie-in with uh, what Lori had to say at lunchtime because she really helped us understand how to frame our messages and what our job is. And um, I think we can learn from the tobacco industry playbook what to anticipate uh, when we put our messages out there. Um, and um, around the world, uh, tobacco companies have very similar tactics and message traits in message frames to forestall regulation everywhere, no matter where it's passed. And I just want to talk about four things that are pretty common that they do. Uh, they have four messages, and the first one is always, there is insufficient evidence to support what it is we want, right? Um, marketing doesn't cause or change behavior, the regulation will have no effect, the health impacts are unproven, and every time these things end up in court, I get these long, thick memos that I have to respond to about my work. Um, and it, the, they pay consultants to go through the science and detail everything that they think is the matter. And in this case, they were commenting on a, on a cross-sectional study about exposure to retail tobacco marketing and youth smoking. And they went for the easy criticism, which is correlation is not causation 
luckily a year later we published the longitudinal study so we ha had a leg up and we're a little ahead of them but arguments about you know well if you knew that kids who rode bicycles to school were more likely to smoke would you outlaw bicycles which is what's in that red box um, those are really really fr frustrating um, there is always a position from the companies that this is that whatever we want to do in terms of restricting marketing is legal infringement um, and they give these various reasons um, and in order to be successful at this work you need to know who their front groups are so for us meet the other NATO right <laughs> then the National Association of Tobacco Outlets um, and the National Association of Convenience Stores will send people in to testify. If you want to get a retailer license, they're going to send a small business in to testify. They prepare memos for them. They do a lot of work uh, on behalf of the corporations. Um, American Beverage Association, I heard about at lunchtime. Other front groups you should be aware of, know them, know who their personnel are, know what their messages are, because that will help you anticipate what's going to go wrong. <laughs> Uh, third thing they do is uh, claim that whatever regulation we propose is redundant. Um, we don't need more regulation. We are, often they say we're self-regulating. We have a voluntary code and it's working very well. Um, we only market to legal users. We oppose underage use. Uh, the existing regulation is satisfactory and every time we try and get licensing fees changed or increased, the industry comes in with messages saying, oh, this, you're just concerned about youth access and you need to do a better job of enforcement. And it always turns in to a message about youth access and enforcement and it's never the message we want, which is place matters. Right? It always gets changed to the frame they care about. Uh, and I put this picture of the Mark 10 product here because there is no regulation for warning labels on e-cigarettes yet, but this is Philip Morris's product and they're going to beat government to the statement on the packaging. Um, this plays into a corporate image campaign. It plays into, well, we're doing it by, you know, we're doing it ourselves. We don't, we don't need you to regulate it. This is fine. Um, we have no science about these messages. We're trying to plan a grant now to, to do a content analysis of warning labels and disclaimers in e-cigarette advertising. We don't really have a good scheme for what the companies are saying about their products, but it's important that we know because this is part of a larger strategy that they always use. Here's my last point. They also tell us to anticipate negative consequences that we haven't thought of yet and they drag out the same ones every time. You've underestimated the cost for us to comply with what you want and the time for implementation. We couldn't possibly give you graphic warning labels in the time you need, or plain packaging, or what, what have you. Um, what you want will result in financial and job losses. Um, this has to do with, uh, for example, increasing retailer licensing or putting uh, display covers in stores so that pro uh, products are hidden behind a clo enclosed cabinet like they wanted to do in New York because that would take more time for the retailers and turn their back on customers which will increase crime and harm to, to small business. Um, they'll talk about regulation being discriminatory, unfair to smaller retailers for example. They'll uh, create a frenzy about illicit trade and fears of illicit trade, which is what they did ar around the issue of banning menthol. And, they, and this all comes back to the, right, the slippery slope. So for example, when we wanted graphic warning labels, <laughs> um, briefs were filed on behalf of tobacco industry from advertising agencies that, that support cereal, cookies, other snack foods because all they had convinced all other industries that this, the step right after the graphic warning on cigarettes was the diseased heart on a package of Oreos, right? They, they're always thinking ahead about what the slippery slope means and how to get a coalition uh, working to support their message. Um, my last thought, when, if we have time left at the, session, at the end of the session, is uh, what the chapters of our playbook should be. Theirs is how to play big, and I think ours should be titled how to play smart. 
Um, so you can th think about uh, whether the Empower framework is a good chapter for our playbook, uh, whether there ought to be a chapter titled Collective Impact, thinking about other lo both local and global alliances because we're all working on so many of the same issues and we have so much to learn in this country from the more progressive marketing restrictions, marketing restrictions elsewhere. Um, so that's uh, the end of what I had to say, but at least it gets us started on what the tobacco playbook is and Jennifer Young is gonna talk about how this translates to other industry. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the food industry um, and how that sort of correlates to what's been done with tobacco. But I wanted to start by addressing what Lisa said at the beginning about her colleague that went to the, um, to the South American um, Forum on Nutrition that was sponsored by PepsiCo. I think it brings up what um, Lori Dorfman talked about um, during the lunchtime presentation about um, we know for we know first and then we see. I think that's so true because we only understand in the context of our own environment. So when I was a child, everybody smoked. My dad was a three pack a day smoker and that's all I knew. I'd walk by the teacher's lounge at school and there'd be blue smoke billowing out. I was on student council and we worked to get a smoking lounge for the students so that they wouldn't all be smoking in the bathroom. We didn't really think that much about it. We didn't think that there could be this world where, you know, smoking was banned in public places or in restaurants. And, um, and I think that's where we are with food right now, is that we can't even imagine a world where, you know, the sugar-sweetened beverages would be behind cases where you couldn't necessarily see them and you'd have to ask for them. So, We'll talk about the um, tobacco playbook and how the food industry has followed a very similar um, model. But I also want you to be thinking about how this can be changed based on what we've learned from tobacco and also some other ways that we may have not even thought of yet. So in 1953, um, many of the large tobacco company executives got together and it was, they had a secret meeting in New York City. And the reason why is because earlier that year, um, the Reader's Digest had published um, an article about studies that linked tobacco to lung cancer. And so they were trying to figure out what their strategy would be because this could totally you know, decimate their industry. And so they came together and they created this sort of master plan or playbook. And the first, um, the first thing that happened came out in January 1954, and it was what's referred to as the Frank Statement. And uh, it was the industry's sort of attempt to say, the public is important to us. We're going to do everything we can to protect the public. So it's sort of the first step in this whole deceitful process that they went through. And actually, they published this in about 450 newspapers nationwide. So thinking about how similar the food industry is, this is sort of the basics of the tobacco industry playbook. Um, really um, talking about personal responsibility, paying scientists who research to instill doubt, Criticizing, criticizing junk science when there is harm found with smoking, self-regulatory pledges, lobbying with massive resources, creating safe products, denying and manipulating the addictive nature of their products, and marketing to children. So that was tobacco. So you think about food and which of those they're doing. So we use tobacco as a model a lot of times when we're talking about nutrition and um, we really started working in public health on obesity issues in the late 90s, early um, 2000s. And at that time there was really no evidence-based research or practices around what to do around food. So we used tobacco as our model for that. And now we know a little bit more, but there are differences between tobacco 
and food. And one is that we have to eat to live. We don't have to smoke to live. Um, although sometimes I'm sure it feels like that to some people. Um, also, selling tobacco is illegal to kids. And currently, kids can buy any kind of junk food they want. Also, tobacco has well-known addictive processes. And with food, those studies are just starting to mature. But I think we'll find that that's a really interesting area that we'll see a lot more in the future. And food industries are far more complex. So when we think about what the tobacco industry dealt with, they had you know, one major product, cigarettes. And there was a handful of companies. But when we talk about food, we're talking about lots and lots of different kinds of foods and beverages and many, many companies. And not only companies, but you know, mom and pop operated places as well. Although there are some main players, and they have a lot of influence. So when we think about the main players, we're thinking about um, agribusiness companies. A lot of them you've heard of, Cargill, Archer Daniels Midland, Monsanto, and some of the major food sellers. Kraft, PepsiCo, McDonald's, Yum Brands, which has um, Pizza Hut, Kentucky Fried Chicken, um, Taco Bell. And so what all of these groups, besides being massive and having a lot of money, have in common is they also have a logo that everybody recognizes as one. And um, they make convenient, usually very processed, very tasty, um, high calorie affordable foods. They also are very organized and are politically very powerful. And they're positioned in key organizations like the American Dietetic Association, which now is called the Academy for Nutrition and Dietetics, and the Obesity Society. So they sponsor and they get themselves embedded in these organizations. And so you have to question the bias of these organizations around them. And I am a registered dietitian, so I have to throw that in. Also, there's the revolving door that we see um, with government. So oftentimes, some of our regular regulatory agencies for food and agriculture, for example, the USDA, they recruit leaders from industry. And so these industry leaders come, they serve, in these regulatory industries, they do their service, and then oftentimes they leave and turn out to be chief lobbyists for these um, industries. So again, and this has happened many, many times, so you have to question the bias that's there. So between 2001, 2006, the public started becoming a little bit more aware about the food industry tactics. Books like Fast Food Nation and um, the Super Size Me movie um, were released. And people started understanding some of what was going on in the food industry. And at this time, there was sort of a crossroads where the industry could decide, OK, you know, we'll start working with the public a little bit more. We'll start promoting healthier products. Um, working with public health a little bit better, or you know, we can just go ahead and talk about the focus really should be on personal responsibility and um, creating fears around freedom. So these are two, I know this was talked about in the last session, but the personal responsibility and freedom of choice those are two distinct values in our American culture. So it's easy to go after them. And it's easy to take, to blame the person that's consuming rather than the groups that are producing, producing and marketing um, these foods. And I'm sure, like me, all of you have been vilified as the food police. And we've heard nanny state over and over when we've tried to do some some work that we feel is very important. And also talking about the, the food companies are often talking about um, the importance of physical activity over food. How important is that? And there's a new, um, it's called Mixify. And I don't know if, has anybody heard of that? It's, it's a new campaign that's 
most of the um, sugar sweetened beverage companies have come together. So PepsiCo and Coca-Cola, um, Dr. Pepper, they've come together and they've created this com campaign which is, is uh, targeted to youth and it talks about the importance of physical activity. If you are going to eat some of these foods, how important it is to be physically active um, just for a, and talks about balance. And then the, the industry also tends to plant doubt and raise concerns um, anytime that industry is brought up as a possible reason that uh, we have problems with obesity. So with public relations and framings, this is part of the um, tobacco industry playbook. Again, talking about the personal responsibility script. Um, Self-regulation as a defense against government action, and Lisa just talked about this with tobacco, but um, this has been discussed since the early 70s, and there have been various um, processes of self-regulation that have gone on, and the latest has been, in the last five years, um, there's been an initiative, the Food and Beverage Advertising Initiative, and they've they've really they've pledged to do a better job. Oftentimes you see products that are high in sodium but are claiming that there's no trans fats. So they sort of divert the attention away from the things that they contain a lot of. But, uh, and then they, they publicize their efforts that they've pledged to make these changes. And then corporate, corporate social responsibility. Uh, I know uh, the international corporate um, accountability group, the same group that got Joe Camel to retire, was trying to get Ronald McDonald to retire. And there was a big push by the industry to say, no, Ronald McDonald is so tied to Ronald McDonald, um, the Ronald McDonald charity. And, and so it didn't work. And with tobacco, I remember as a kid, um, the Virginia Slims tennis tournaments that promoted women's tennis. That was a big deal. But then when women started getting lung cancer, they couldn't speak up because here the tobacco industry had been so influential. And so instead they focused their efforts on breast cancer and talking about that. Okay, creating doubt. This again is from the tobacco industry playbook and it works just as well with food. Um, scientists that are paid to um, you know, create studies that or work on studies are funded by food industry um, that show something different than studies that aren't. And when they've done meta-analysis, they've seen that the, the industry-supported studies really do show a difference than the studies that are um, non-industry uh, funded. Conflicts of interest, again, um, industry getting on boards or funding major groups like the Obesity Society and the Dietetic Association. And industry front groups. So this is something new for me that I didn't know about until just recently, and now I'm hearing about them all the time. So industry front groups also called astroturfing, which is where they look like grassroots organizations, nonprofit grassroots organizations, but actually they're funded by industry. So the Center for Consumer Freedom, which sometimes their emails pop up in my email box, but they are actually an uh, astroturfing um, industry front group. So addiction, another um, Another area that tobacco has had to deal with, and I think that we're going to see more and more of the food industry having to deal with. There's lots of research going on you know, with sugar to see if it has addictive properties. But we know, for example, that caffeine does, and how that's manipulated in products, especially energy drinks. I don't know if any of you saw, but this week, the Red Center um, released its new sugar sweetened beverage facts. And in 2013, um, actually, soda consumption has decreased, but energy drinks have increased by 46%. And when we think about the caffeine and the sugar together that are in things like soda, energy drinks, frappuccinos, 
that's a lot of calories that people are getting. And um, the book, Salt, Fet Salt Sugar, Fat, um, how many have read that book? I just think it's such an excellent book. So if you get a chance, read it. But it really talks about the addictive, um, that the industry knows that there's an addictive processes with food. In fact, it links it to like morphine experiences with some foods and finding that bliss point where it's that perfect place for salt, fat, and sugar to come together in a product and it causes your brain just to want more. And I put the Cheetos up there because they talk about Cheetos and they talk about the bliss point of Cheetos, but also with the puff factor of Cheetos when you bite into them. Um, it, your brain has this feeling that the calories are evaporating. And so kind of like uh, sweetened beverages that don't contain any protein or anything, that just go right through you, your brain doesn't register those calories. But of course, the food industry is in denial or talks about denying any of this. So product marketing, I know that Lori talked a lot about food marketing and so I'll just touch on this. But um, food marketing is more aggressively targeted to children than adults and to minorities. And in the uh, Red Center Sugar Sweet and Beverage Facts, it said that African American youth see twice as many ads for soda than white youth. And digitally, digitally, we know that um, Hispanic and African American are targeted so much more for fast food than, um, than white. Industry self-regulating. Uh, so we talked about that a little bit before with the pledges. Well, here you can see we have a um, Dora the Explorer. And OK, so we know soup has a ton of sodium, but I think that is saying no trans fats. With Shrek here, we have all the industry, you know, all the, um, the regulating little labels here of what on the top. But, uh, but here we have this horrible looking sugary cereal, but it's whole grains. So. And the other, the other piece is the marketing strategies that are used by industry. So we have Beyonce in the corner with Pepsi. I was so sad when um, she did these ads because she had just been working with Michelle Obama on the Let's Move campaign. And then there she was um, advertising Pepsi on the Super Bowl. And uh, research has found that with sugary cereals, and any of you that have kids or go shopping with kids, know that they put the sugary cereals right down where the kids can see them. Well, they've also done studies where they know that the eyes of these characters are looking right at the kids. So it's very deceptive, and it's and very insidious, and it goes all through the marketing industry, and that could be a whole nother lecture. Um, but we really don't have a stand a chance against a lot of this. And so when they try to invoke personal responsibility, you just think about it, you know? And, and again, I think that we will, you know, in 20, 30 years, we'll look back and we'll think, how dare they? But we need to build awareness before that happens. So what's positive? What's working positively to make changes? Well, in terms of food, there's a group called the Food Marketing Work Group, and Lori um, just spoke a little bit about this earlier. Um, but it's, it's a group of about 120 organizations that have a coordinated effort to raise awareness about food marketing. And um, so Lori helps chair that with um, the Berkeley Media Studies Group and also the um, Center for Science and the Public Interest, CSPI, um, is the other co-chair. And so this group has done a lot um, to help raise awareness. I am a representative for this group for the Nutrition Council of Oregon and for the National Association of Public Health Nutritionists. And so I've been able to be on phone calls and learn what they're doing, and um, it's great work. Also, building awareness through engaging in social media. One of the um, 
groups that belongs to uh, the Food Marketing Work Group is called Moms Rising. Has anybody heard of Moms Rising? Yeah, they do, they have lots of areas of interest, but food marketing is one of them. And they send out all kinds of tweets. And, you know, if, if for example, a fast food industry is thinking of creating a new Happy Meal or giving some special toy, they'll just target their tweets to them. And um, it's made a huge difference. Also, the Food Marketing Work Group has worked with um, big industry like McDonald's to start making um, the healthier choice the default. So in terms of like for McDonald's has said that they are going to do this within the next few years, but instead of having the toy come with a soda and fries, it will start to come with milk and apple slices. So the healthier choice will be the default choice and parents will have to ask for the soda and the fries, but it will come with milk and, or, or water or juice. Um, and another huge um, positive change has been Berkeley passing the soda tax. They're the first city in the nation that's been able to do that. And so hopefully that will be a tipping point where others will be able to see that it's possible. And as Lori said, the industry put in $10 million between San Francisco and Berkeley, and Berkeley was able to pass with 75% of the vote. So hopefully things will move that way. And also um, food marketing in schools has been addressed in the new school wellness policy, so we'll see a change with that. I think the, the one piece that um, I think I skipped over that I was going to talk about um, was self-regulation. And the industry says that they're self-regulating, and they have shown that they're able to sell healthier products, but they're not self-regulating in terms of the things that children want. So even if they have healthier products, they're still providing tie or doing the tie-ins with movies and cartoon characters. Their packaging isn't self-regulated, and as far as marketing to kids, that's what the kids want. The kids want the experience they see on TV at McDonald's. They don't care as much about the food. They want the toy. They want to go where they see people having fun. Um, if you have kids in school, you know your kids will come home and say, oh, so-and-so had a Lunchable. They want that, that packaging. And so that's another area that we can really work on in terms of um, making changes is trying to get them to self-regulate that piece. So that's all I had today for you. And so we'll open it up to questions for both Lisa and I. I think it depends on what our purpose is. So um, when we go to do sort of consumer education kinds of activities or youth prevention kinds of activities, um, we should certainly lose, use the language that our audience recognizes. Um, and, and that's important for surveillance as well. Um, and there's a great scholar at Uni University of Oklahoma who's doing a lot of work on uh, vape shops, for example, and um, he has a huge list of terms um, that we're slowly pushing into uh, surveillance surveys so that when we ask somebody about the use of e-cigarette or um, vape pen or you know, e-hookah or whatever it is, we're, we're following the lingo as, it, as our audience understands it. I think what I meant is um, when I'm speaking about regulation or writing articles or, or making presentations to an, <coughs> excuse me, an audience like this, I think part of denormalizing the industry is not accepting that it's okay to call those things e-juice when, when we all know better. That's what I meant. Um, but, uh, but your question is a good one, and of course when you're um, trying to reach an audience that that doesn't know better, and that's not your message until you you sort of <laughs> have them hooked, and you and you're moving your way down from edu from education about the product, 
and the risk to education about the vector, um, that's, that's when it's important to talk about, to make that distinction. That was such a great question. Thank you, because I bungled my message. <laughs> Good. So I think you see it in a lot of places with the food industry, um, even as a marketing tactic, because one of my favorite um, awful things was when um, Kentucky Fried Chicken was, um, had a pink bucket of chicken that if you bought it, $5 went to breast cancer research. I'm not sure if that's what you're asking, but, but yeah, it's used all the time. Or funding playgrounds, you know, Pepsi funds playgrounds. What did I hear that Pepsi or Coke is putting in a walking trail somewhere in, in Portland? I mean, we see it all the time where they're deflecting um, away from, you know, kind of the, the bad that they do and promoting good. So. Um, I, I think New York has paved the way on this in, in some ways. Uh, they, they really started on a voluntary uh, campaign. Um, that's not the way California is going, but because it was a voluntary campaign, they had a lot of uh, public opinion work to do, both in terms of um, the consumer public and the retail owner public. Um, so that subway, that transit poster that I showed you earlier this morning was part of that campaign. But they also went out and conducted retailer interviews, um, kind of motivational interviewing, uh, talking to retailers about uh, the impact of marketing in their stores on uh, disenfranchised c uh, consumers uh, on the community. And there are lots of themes to pick up on there. Um, there's um, tobacco waste. Uh, in front of stores that sell tobacco products and what that does uh, to a community norm. Um, and I, uh, I think the idea of establishing partnerships is, is important and, and really difficult, and there's some good, some good examples out there in the literature about what can be done in terms of uh, retailer interviews and focus groups and finding themes that, that resonate. Um, with that important constituency, and the work we want to do can't can't happen in, unless that happens first. But but I agree with you; it's tricky. Yeah. I think that <clears throat> I think that's such a hard question because I people are just stuck. You know, we see that with working with schools. Um, we have school wellness policies that aren't going to allow some of this now. And, and we've been moving away from that with schools for a while, this sort of corporate fast food and, and, it's, and fundraising. And it's really, really tough because there's not another source of funding. And so I think that um, <clears throat> at this point, you know, it's just really people feel stuck. So I'm not sure really what the answer is, but, but it's a good question because it's a hard one. Um, <laughs> I'm going to give the academic answer, which is, we need more research. Um, it's, it's unfortunate that what we know about sort of uh, corporate social responsibility um, has been mostly about sort of exposing what the industry does and understanding that playbook and how they align themselves with charitable organizations. We haven't answered the next question which is what happened to the reputation of that, that's the charitable organization um, after their alliance with, with Big Tobacco. Um, and until we can demonstrate to organizations that, that, that there's a, a burden there um, and a, and a trade-off there, um, I can understand why it's hard to turn down that money. And in public health, we, there's not enough of it to go around. Um, so, so that's a real issue, and, and I, wish, I wish I had the perfect study to demonstrate that a, a nonprofit group was better off <laughs> refusing that alliance than accepting it for some number of consequences, how, how their constituents view them, um, what 
what later funding came to them. And it, and it may come to being like it is for us scientists. I'm, I mean, I am an, an editor at a journal where we do not accept articles that were funded by tobacco. And uh, as a public health agency, I suppose you have the right to make the same decision about giving out grants so that you might need to inform applicants that that's your, you've decided that's your priority and if they've accepted money from industry, they may not have a grant from Oregon Public Health or whatever, whatever other agency is relevant, but, but the, wow. <laughs> That's, that's the parallel for, for, from, from my perspective. I, my sum total knowledge about this topic is the NPR segment about genetically modified fish. Um, I, you know, I don't know anything about this, but hearing your story about it, um, it kind of reminds me of uh, what leverage the public health community got out of publicizing the fact that the tobacco industry spent more uh, on self-aggrandizement about their charitable contributions than on the charities themselves. And it seems like there's a very direct parallel here. If the industry's argument was about costs, and yet they spent more on the campaign than the actual cost burden they were talking about, that's a message. Um, and I wish Lori were here to tell us how to frame it <laughs> and what we want from it um, before we start wordsmithing it, but that, that to me is a, is a great um, direction to run from that experience. Does that make sense? Never talk about what the industry wants us to talk about. That's my thought. Don't talk about youth access. That, they love that issue. So uh, my, <laughs> my, my ba I, I went to, had ex I saw a speaker um, say, you know, her basic slide was, anything they like, I don't like. It's a, you know, it's a perfect rule to live by. So I, I think the best advice is stay away from their themes and stick to the messages that matter. And denormalizing, exposing industry ties, um, not accepting the notion that the product is somehow so different from tobacco, that the industry is so different from tobacco, that's the, I mean, Boy, talk about a lesson about staying on message. Um, d don't don't go to youth access. I, I just I would avoid it at all costs. And this <laughs> reminds me of a conversation with uh, a, an attorney in Providence, Rhode Island. We were talking about the flavor ban and how things were going and what the complications were. And he it was communicating a similar misunderstanding among retailers about licensing. Um, and particularly among e-cigarette retailers about whether they needed a license under this new regulatory scheme. <laughs> and his answer was, I don't know, I can't answer that for you, you'll have to talk to your attorney. Um, even though he knew what the answer was. Um, <laughs> and I just, um, I, I just think it's important to, to try where we can to steer a, steer the conversation away from what from the from the themes they like, um, because it's counterproductive. For for certain, it's counterproductive. I have a feeling I dodged your question a little bit because you wanted to know what to tell teenagers, right? I I mean I guess it's uh, um, If teenagers are asking about the product and asking about the ability to access the product, is the, the maybe the best question is why would you want to do that? You know, our time is up for this session, but I want to thank you all for being here and for the great questions.